I find these values to be very harmful. They're harmful to all of us. Uh, they're harmful to women. They're harmful to men. But most impactfully, they are harmful to kids. Um, because when kids are not able to voice their own sense perceptions of reality, when, when they are told they are not allowed to trust their bodies, what they see and hear <laughs> uh, with their eyes and their ears, that endangers them. You must be some kind of therapist. I am some kind of therapist, and I'm about to take you on a journey through the inner wilderness. I've invited brilliant guests from all walks of life to join me as we investigate, illuminate, and inspire transformation in ourselves, intimate relationships, and the social ecosystems we are constellated in. What you are about to hear may surprise you, so hang on to your earbuds for a hefty dose of sanity in a chaotic world. I am Stephanie Wynn, a licensed marriage and family therapist, branching out and building bridges between psychology and everything else under the sun. It's my honor to have you along for the ride. Let's get started. Today, I am so excited to interview my, if I may say, friend, Amy Sousa. Um, Amy is one of those people who has helped me realize that there is such a thing as having a friend on the internet because (laughs) we've never actually met in person. But uh, Amy and I actually connected originally through Twitter spaces. And every time we were in one of those group calls together, it would just be this like bubbly interaction of, oh, this is my person. We we vibe together. So we've been meaning to schedule a podcast recording date for months, actually. I'm so excited to finally be able to have one of our riveting conversations recorded so that other people can listen to it later. Amy and I have a lot of points of connection. So her field is somatic psychology. She leads women's retreats and does embodiment-based coaching. And uh, we've connected a lot about values and psychology and embodiment and personal empowerment. So I'm really excited to explore all those topics today and see where they take us. Amy, will you introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Stephanie, so much. And it is just absolutely a pleasure um, to be here. And like, as you said, just like taking the conversation deeper and further and um, yeah, sharing it with everyone. Uh, So yeah, so my original background, and I think you know this, but I don't I don't remember how much I've told you about it. Uh, is the theater. Um, so that is where I did I did my undergraduate in New York at NYU. And I worked for years and years for the Brooklyn Arts Council uh, in New York City. And then I moved, uh, when I moved to Washington, I was the education director uh, for a theater here. So This is where I did kind of work like um, in New York City, I did a lot of like conflict resolution and anger management and self-esteem building and um, understanding long-term consequences and use theater to kind of do this uh, personal work. And then um, when I was doing, um, when I was the education director, I did a lot of uh, play building. So I would work with teens and we would do uh, building plays. And I was really interested in helping students tell their own stories in their own voices, and it gave them an opportunity to speak about their own values. And so from here, um, I went into my, my graduate and my postgraduate studies. And ultimately, uh, this became the work of my dissertation, which um, I did not end up defending. uh, But it is, you know, you know how they go. I have hundreds and hundreds of pages written into it. And but this was my curiosity. And it's still ultimately my curiosity, um, which is looking at the, the, the tools that the creative imagination gives us. And I was really interested in that intersection um, between that work um, that I had done as a theater educator for 20 years and how that really intersected with um, the understandings that I found in kind of somatic and archetypal psychology and, and how those things went together. And I became really interested in the topic of internal authority building. 
So I became really interested in uh, how experiential processes like theater or any really creative practice gave us really um, access to knowledge formation. And this knowledge formation ultimately was authority building because because it was experienced. And it's anything that you learn through experience, of course, uh, cannot be taken away from you, you know? So facts can always be supplanted by other facts. Um, a fact like the earth is flat, or <laughs> we, we thought once as humans that the earth was flat. And that fact can be supplanted by a new fact like, oh, the earth is round. Now we know a new fact. So my, my knowledge basis is actually supplanted by new knowledge if I'm only basing my knowledge in a place of facts. And not that facts aren't important. Obviously, they are, they are a really useful tool to have. But I became really interested in what it takes to build internal authority systems. Uh, and internal authority... Um, is not really based on what you sort of uh, can cognitively pick up with um, your factual understandings of things. That internal authority building, uh, a lot of times, in my opinion, is really based on what is experienced, what you go through. Uh, and that ends up giving you a basis uh, for making judgments and evaluations and having boundaries and... <laughs> And ultimately, um, a lot of things that are, are based in embodiment, um, which is another field of my study, um, which is ultimately phenomenology, which we could go off in that direction, too, <laughs> um, which is the study of being and that being being based in our bodies. So uh, really, you know, if we look at like the usual kind of uh, Descartian understanding of things, the, the I think, therefore I am, uh, phenomenology says actually <laughs> – beingness is is before that beingness is experienced before our think function beingness is experienced in the location of our bodies and that we are our bodies and that anything that we ultimately even have to like think about cognitively or understand mentally or know we can only think about or understand or know because of our primary experience of beingness, um, which is experienced through our embodiment and through our relationship with the world. So these are kind of my, my grounding philosophies that I care about and I, I love to kind of talk about and explore and all of the other things that I do, um, which are, yeah, I do a lot of uh, individual work with women and the retreats that I do with women and the activism that I do for women. <laughs> um, all of this is kind of ultimately based in, in those original value sets that, that I developed over my professional life. I can imagine how having that background in theater and drama would give you this robust training in embodiment because, first of all, it takes courage to act in any capacity, no matter how small your audience. And uh, I think courage is a catalyst for all kinds of other strengths to develop. And then in order to act, you have to use your whole body. You're not just yeah. speaking lines. You're not reading a script. You are embodying that character through your facial expressions, tone of voice, your physical posture, your movement. And I can connect the dots and imagine how the the drama background connects with the somatic background and with the, yeah. the values and embodiment work that you do. Yeah. So you talk about this concept of inner authority. I know that's something that we've explored privately before, and it means slightly different things to each of us given our backgrounds, but then we come together on shared meaning. So share more about what you mean when you say inner authority. I think that inner authority for me is about a couple of things. Uh, so one, I think it's about knowing yourself, you know, so that is sort of like 
I guess, a full body knowing, I would say, you know, knowing yourself physically and knowing yourself uh, mentally and knowing yourself emotionally. And I, I would say it's kind of, I guess, I grounded maybe in an idea that I'm not I'm not hiding anything from myself. So I think that internal authority is, is based on that knowingness. And it's based on a self-trust. So I also, I, I know myself and I also trust myself. So I, I trust my own instincts. Um, I trust my intuitions. I trust my background. And I'm not, maybe I'm not, I'm not doing as much like trying this. I'm just like allowing. Not that I don't think those things are always mutually ex exclusive. And I don't think anyone is going to have maybe like a perfect <laughs> internal authority. I think there's always going to be things that we fudge at. But I think when people, you know, have that groundedness of having an internal authority, it's a lot harder to rock you off of your center. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny because we, you were telling a story before we opened up this conversation. And I, I won't share it, but it reminded me of this. And you can share it afterwards if, if you have. I don't, I don't remember if you've shared this online or not, so I don't want to say it for you. But it reminded me of another story, um, which is something that I always use when I talk about embodiment. And, and to me, this also has to do with internal authority building. For example, if I have internal authority, I don't have to put up a lot of barriers. So to me, having internal authority is a little bit about the difference between boundaries and barriers. And the example that I like to use, which is one that I got from my own mentor, uh, which is that you can have a vacant house, let's say. And that vacant house, you can put up a giant barbed wire fence around that vacant house. But it ultimately doesn't matter how much barbed wire and how tall the fence, people will see that that house is vacant, you know, and kids will break in and they'll have their parties in there. They'll throw bottles through the windows. Drug dealers will break in and have their um, <laughs> have their do their drug dealings in there because it doesn't matter how big the barrier is. Everyone can see that the house is vacant. But if you are fully occupied, if you are fully embodied, if you are claiming yourself and your authority, it's like a house that has the lights on and the grass is mowed and there's flowers on the lawn. You don't have to have any fence. You might have a little picket fence, but you don't really even, you don't even really need a fence at all because everyone can see, oh, someone's living there. <laughs> the lights are on. Someone's home. It's such a good analogy, Amy. I recall you having used that in a previous conversation we had. And as you could see, I was chuckling while you were saying it because... Is the first time I've heard you share that analogy since I was burglarized. And so, okay, yeah, good. I didn't like want to share really that part. <laughs> perfect timing. I mean, I don't mind sharing with my audience. So I lived in this house. It was the first house I bought. I bought it a little over four years ago. And I was living in it that whole time in a very rough neighborhood in Portland. And I had a lot of reasons to feel unsafe while I was there, but I also did everything I could to occupy that house and to fill it with my own energy and to, you know, fill the yard with my intentions for my garden. And I created the nicest home that I could in that environment, even though it never felt like a safe neighborhood. And I moved out last month and have been in the process of getting the house ready for sale. And within a couple of weeks of moving out, the house was burglarized. Um, so Amy's analogy is, is so perfect. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm dealing with the situation, you know, I'm I, so sorry. I, <laughs> it's, so upsetting. it's, it's funny that you brought that up though, Amy, because I, I frequently find myself almost accidentally bringing up stories that are uncannily relevant to someone sometimes in a triggering or provoking way, but I'm okay with it now because, you know, like I said, it took 10 hours for the cops to arrive because this is Portland and there are riots. Um, but Ultimately, I'm dealing with my insurance and still on track to sell that house. But it was just such a spot on analogy. And part of what I've done to secure the house since then is I've worked with people in my support network and we have 
someone else's car is in my driveway and yep. there's a radio on and there's lights going off and on and the garden was recently touched up. So yeah, I, I, I love the analogy. Let, let's go back to boundaries versus barriers. You're saying that when you're embodied, it creates this robust kind of natural immunity because you're inhabiting your own life. And if you're not present in your own life, then you can try to create these artificial constructs to protect yourself, but you're not really there at that basic level of sensation. Mm -mm. So that brings up for me the gestalt awareness cycle, yeah. which starts with sensation, yeah. right? And then that sensation has to come into our awareness. And then when we're aware of a sensation, take hunger, for example, because that's yeah. something that comes up every single day, we become aware of that sensation, then we can become aware that there are options in our environment. We start scanning the environment. What am I going to eat? And once we scan our environment for options, we can mobilize toward making a choice and we can ultimately make contact and satisfy that need so that we can eventually withdraw and move on. That's the gestalt awareness or need fulfillment cycle in a nutshell. And I hear you starting with sensation and being yeah. present in your body to have that awareness of that sensation because if you have a healthy process of feeling your sensations and knowing what they mean, being able to interpret them, what does this tell me about what I need to do? What are my options? And you practice living that way over and over. You strengthen that skill set so that you know that you can take care of yourself. And I think it's when people struggle with that that their boundaries tend to become more rigid when they do try to have boundaries because they're not used to it, right? So then it's like... Yeah. I, I don't know what I want. I don't know what I need. I'm just going to tell you to back off or I'm going to tell you to do this for yeah. me because I, I don't know how to do it for myself. You know, and I think, you know, I'm glad that you, yeah, of course, like brought up sensations and that that natural gestalt of them because the sensations are, you know, they're a natural guidance system. You know, that that's why, you know, if you put your hand on a hot pan, you're going to recoil because your body is protecting yourself. That sensation is there as a guidance system to protect you, um, to keep you safe. Or if you're hungry, that sensation is there as a guidance system. Um, it's a natural guidance system. And I think that a problem in our culture is that we actually put a lot of um, value in being um, having a high pain threshold, let's say. Um, my friend who's a mm -hmm. massage therapist is always telling me that. Like people come to her all the time and they're like, well, I have a very high pain tolerance. And she's like, that is telling me that you are ignoring the cues that your body is giving you. So she's like, I don't, <laughs> that's not something to brag about. You shouldn't be bragging about that to me. Don't be bragging that you are ignoring the cues that your body is giving you to protect you and keep you safe. That that's not something you should brag about. You know, if you feel pain, you should respond to it. And I think that our physical sensations are absolutely a guidance system and our emotional sensations are also a guidance system. And I do think you're right. Like sometimes we might misinterpret them. You know, you might have a feeling of, I don't know, sadness or depression that you are misinterpreting. But usually that guidance system is accurate. It's telling you something. And usually uh, it's something about your external environment. You know, usually it's that something in your external environment needs to change. Uh, and it, it's giving you this cue <laughs> so that you can respond to it. And, and I think that's also part of this internal authority building uh, process and practice is being responsive to our own cues, to our own sensations, to our instincts, to our intuitions. And my my good friend Erin will often talk about she'll she loves to like break words apart. She she does this really fun thing. And and whenever she she ha she finds like a compound word, she'll like really break it apart and play with it. And she does that with responsibility. And that that responsibility is our actually our ability uh, to respond to things. And, and I think that responsibility is our responsibility to ourself. Um, but our responsibility to ourself is, is to be responsive to our own needs, 
you know, and to take care of ourselves. Uh, and that's an internal authority building because how can, how can I take care of other people? You know, it's like, the metaphor of putting my own oxygen mask on, like how can I help save the other people on the plane if I'm not taking care of myself? You talk about being able to trust that guidance. And I think we would agree that it's a process that gets stronger over time. Mm -hmm. Earlier, you're talking about self-trust. And I work with a lot of people who struggle with self-trust. Yeah. Well, self-trust isn't all that different from trust in any other relationship. Self-trust yeah. is about building trust between the different parts of yourself. And part of that is if I tell myself I'm going to do something, do I follow through on it? Am I, am I consistent, reliable, honoring my needs? A lot of people struggle with those things for a variety of reasons that a good therapist can help you explore. But ultimately, I think that there's a, a feedback loop that you and I are talking about. And one of the reasons that we can both speak, speak so confidently about it is because we have years of our own personal experience of strengthening and honing that yeah. feedback loop. You know, yeah, I work a lot with people of personal who, work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And of course, it, the your radar isn't that strong or your self-trust or your guidance isn't that strong if it's been disrupted or if it yeah. wasn't allowed to form in the first place, right? So, uh, you know, as a therapist, I work with people who can be really in their heads a lot of the time. And yeah. some people, you know, especially for instance, like the Enneagram type six personality, which is very intellectual, is kind of always looking for that external guidance in a mental way, right? What is the yeah. right or the wrong thing to do according to my religion or according to what other people think? And, and that can just be, it can drive you absolutely bonkers because, if you don't have that anchor inside that that is kind of a well-honed instinct and you have to think every single thing through i mean first of all that just takes a long time and second of all you if you're looking to to sources outside of yourself there are so many yeah. and they're always going to conflict i mean we live in a world with almost 8 billion people and a lot of different religions and worldviews so ultimately you you just kind of have to pick your own and go with it <laughs> try it out and see how it works for you so in my experience, uh, anxiety and things like religious abuse, emotional abuse, overly strict households, or paradoxically neglect that yeah. created an environment where a person couldn't really get comfortable around, in their own skin because their needs were so vastly undermet. Those are all some factors that can make it hard for people to develop this self-trust or this inner authority in the first place. I'm curious yeah. uh, what you would add to that about what are some reasons that this might be hard for someone and then how do they start building that? Yeah, I think the things that you mentioned are are key. I was thinking when you were talking about that kind of uh, linear person who wants a set of rules, you know, that would be nice. <laughs> like rules are really nice guidance systems. And that's why, you know, things like uh, religion, for example, gives people a lot of comfort because there's there's these like rules that you follow and you you have this notion that if you're following the rules, then you're doing the right thing. I ex excelled at school. I'm sure you did as well. But I think that gave me great comfort um, because I was like following this rules and it was like a way to like a trusted way that I could get some positive feedback for myself. And I knew what to do and I knew how to excel at it um, by following the rules. But ultimately life is not, it's not a set of linear rules. Um, we are in a constantly spontaneous system that is changing all around us. So there is no set of rules that you can follow uh, for the environment because the environment is always fluctuating and it's it's always something that you are going to have to adapt in. So there's no rules for this constant adaptation. And in fact, if you are going um, by a linear set of rules, that can put you in a place of danger because you might be listening to those rules rather than your own intuition. You know, like we have have these guidance systems for good reason, but we have to take them with a grain of salt. Like we might say, you know, it's not safe to walk down um, a dark alley alone. Now that 
is a good guidance system, but it's not a hard and fast rule. Um, and it's more important for me to be able to trust my own intuition. Like say I'm being followed, you know, it's more important for me to trust my own intuition than to like follow the rule. Like I need to be in touch, spontaneously in touch with my own intuition. And I do think the things that get in our way, um, I would say I loved what the kind of growing up situations that you mentioned. I think growing up in culture gets in our way. Everyone. It gets in everyone's way because culture is constantly bombarding us with ultimately what is a set of programming um, that is telling us a lot of information about how it is important to be and who it is important to be and what success looks like. And it's everywhere. You know, it's at the grocery store. <laughs> um, it's it's on the highway when you're driving on billboards. Um, it's, it's in the television and films that you watch watch. It's in, it's in the books that you read. Um, so you're, you're getting a lot of constant external information that makes it really hard uh, sometimes to listen to that internal voice. Because if you give those external voices more authority <laughs> than you give yourself, um, that that's going to be really conflicting. And that's going to make it hard to listen to your own guidance system. Uh, so ultimately, you know, we have to um, we have to know that we are the best authority on ourselves. And I think the last thing that gets in our way, um, you know, is trauma. Just any very traumatic event is going to get in the way. And, um, you know, I've spoken about this uh, online and, and in my writing, uh, you know, but I was raped and that broke my trust and it, it broke my trust with with men. <laughs> it broke my trust with the world <laughs> as, as a safe environment. And it ultimately, though, I think the worst thing that it did was it broke my trust with myself. Um, now, this was actually part of my, it was another part of the piece of the puzzle why I was even led into uh, psychology in the first place. Um, but I wanted, you know, ultimately to find my way back and to figure out how to come back into a place where I could trust myself. Because, you know, if you, when, I'll just speak for myself, when I was in a place where I could not trust myself, you know, because because the person who raped me was a, a known quantity, he was a friend. I thought, or I thought he was a friend. Obviously, he was not a friend. But I thought at the time that he was a friend of mine. I had known him, you know, maybe for over a year. And I had hung out with him and other people. And so I the the trauma made me think like oh my god i can't read people i don't know who to trust i don't know how like i not only i can't trust men i can't trust myself to make a, a judgment about the people that i surround myself with apparently now after having studied what i've studied um and i i talk a lot in my own work, um, I don't know if you've read Gavin De Becker and The Gift of Fear. Um, he he talks a lot about our intuitions, and he will say a lot of times in these traumatic scenarios, if you look back at the little signs that the intuition was telling you, you will see little clues that we're trying to say, hey, this is maybe not right. You know, and looking backwards, I can see there were little signs that were like, hey, this isn't right. These these weird things are going on. Now, I can't, I could not have extrapolated them in the moment like A plus B would end up rape, but I could have extrapolated in the moment, this is not someone who is listening to me. You know, this is not someone who cares about me. This is someone who is not like putting any value in the things that I'm saying uh, or showing an interest really in me. So there there are things that I could have extrapolated um, if I had been listening to the little cues where I might have been like, you know what? I'm not going to spend any more time on this person. You know, I'm going to walk away from this before it gets any more intimate than it is right now. And these ways back into self-trust or or the things that I guess the things that separate us from our self-trust and the things that lead us back is um ultimately I found I, I couldn't trust myself while I was living in constant anxiety either. Because living in constant anxiety, 
um, was also separating me from self-trust because instead of listening you know, to those internal voices and listening to my own sense perceptions of what I was seeing and feeling around me, um, I had a, a constant bombardment of information going on. Um, so you can't listen to your alert system if you are in a place where like you're on high alert all the time. You know, you're not going to hear your car alarm go off if if you're just always surrounded by bullhorns. You know, you, you won't be able to hear it. Um, so I do think, um, unfortunately, trauma is, is a huge disruptor. Um, and you know, a lot of, a lot of us, I mean, really it's very hard to get through this life without experiencing trauma. Mm -hmm. It's very rare to get through your time on earth without experiencing a trauma of one sort or another. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like, we have to value ourselves enough to like get back from that. Earlier, you were describing inner authority as comprising these elements of, I never remember, is it comprising or comprised of? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that a word that, when you sounded good when you said it. It's <laughs> a word we get tricky with. Composed of, I could say, to be safe. Um, these two elements of self-knowledge and self-trust. And mm -hmm. so you talked about how in your experiences leading up to being assaulted, there were these little moments where you weren't listening to that little voice. And and I imagine that the self-knowledge piece is the piece that knows why do I get in my own way? When when my spidey sense is telling me something or I want or don't want something and I don't listen to it, what are my fears or my narratives or my learned behaviors that stop me from listening to that, right? So I think for a lot of women and others uh, who have been through a similar journey, it's like, things pertaining to low self-esteem or, uh, you know, previous abuse or wanting to be liked, right? There, there are these kind of personal hangups we can have that are part of, if we're not careful, our vulnerability to eroding ourselves in those moments that there is some infringement developing. But yeah, you get stronger, right? You and yeah. I are both survivors. You're resilient. You don't identify with that victimization as part of who you are. But I also love that you pointed out that the impact of the trauma was, it was negative beliefs about the world, right? Lack yeah. of ability to trust the world and men and, and but also that trust in yourself. And yeah. I think we leave this out of the picture sometimes when we talk about trauma. Um, you know, one thing that's been on my mind lately is that in some of the most horrific things that I went through personally, the almost like the worst lingering parts that I still suffer from yeah, aren't so much the flashbacks of what happened in which I was a victim, but the shame of, yeah, having ended up there in the first place, yeah, uh, the shame of what I did to allow it, and the shame of how it impacted the rest of my life and how other people saw me. Right. Because during some of the roughest times in my life, when I was trying really hard to kind of maintain and survive and cover for what was happening at home and all of that, you know, I ended up kind of embarrassing myself with how the ongoing trauma would leak out around other yeah. people in various settings. And and it's crazy to think about that, wow, with with everything that happened to me, the the part that I feel the worst about is how I broke down crying in front of a colleague. Like Really? You know? Um, and I say that as a therapist, but but these things are very real. The erosion of self-trust yeah. uh, is is a very real part of uh, the trauma process. And healing that is is a, an important part of, of the healing process. And that's where the self-knowledge and the self-forgiveness comes in, self-compassion, and strengthening those boundaries, like you were talking about earlier, as opposed to barriers, by coming back home to your body and uh, developing a sense that, that it's a safe and welcoming place again, becoming yeah. responsive to your needs, responsive to that awareness cycle so that you can start to tune into what you're needing and making your body a more comfortable place to be. Yeah. I have so you know, many notes already. Oh, okay, what good. Gonna I'm gonna, I want to respond. You, you think of your notes, but I want to respond to two things that you said. Um, 
which which goes into um, how how do we develop these boundaries and and also how did I get myself here? Mm-hmm. Um, so ultimately, um, just as a culture in general, we we really overprivilege our our rational linear processes. We privileges we privilege that prefrontal cortex part of our brain where we think things, you know. And especially those of us, um, you know, who are very smart, um, we're going to privilege that even more because this has been a great tool for us, um, and it's done a lot of like great work for us, and it's got us a lot of accolades. And and recognition in the world, um, but ultimately, that that rational part of the brain often comes into play. Unfortunately, during those um, like pre-trauma moments, where we we start rationalizing what's happening, um, this shouldn't be happening. This 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 isn't quite right. I don't I don't know if it's happening or not. But I, that's not how he was before. You know, we we start this whole rationalization process, which one it 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 disconnects us from our intuitions. You know, when 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 a when a rabbit sees a wolf, it doesn't start a rationalization process. It responds to the scenario. It doesn't start a process that's like, well, I don't know anything about this wolf. This wolf could be a nice wolf. Like, I don't know what he wants or doesn't want. Maybe we, I should wait and see. I'm just going to wait and see what's going to happen. Like, animals don't rationalize their fear away, you know? So, you know, Gavin DeBecker, one of the things he talks about is when that fear response comes up, as soon as that fear response comes up, you got to respond. Um, but if you are, if you've gone into a rationalizing process, now you've disconnected yourself from those those primary instincts of of, of self protection um, and fear. Uh, and I think also <laughs> that our rational processes get in the way of our healing a lot of times. You know. Um, you know, one of the other things that I learned from my mentor that I share with women that I work with uh, is that you cannot think your way out of something that you experienced your way into. Mm. Um, so we we try to also rationalize our trauma away. Um, and I love that you brought up shame because, of course, you know, I felt so much shame as well. And I also felt shame with my post-trauma responses, even though in a way, I was just having I was just having a response to what happened to me. But yeah, like, you know, I I drank way too much. I had really reckless behavior, very reckless behavior that could have harmed other people. Thank God it just harmed me sometimes, but it, it maybe emotionally harmed uh, friends of mine, but uh, I had very irresponsible, reckless um, behavior that I'm not proud of, and I I also had a lot of shame, and and the thing is, I also didn't want to feel my shame. I didn't want to feel a lot of my feelings. I didn't want to. I mean, that's that's a and that's a great. The thing is, I think that what's great to also like parse out a little bit is like, you know, I dissociated my trauma now. That was a really good tool during the event. During the actual event, it was a really useful tool to dissociate. But that dissociation stayed and stayed and stayed. <laughs> mm-hmm. So um, I I didn't want to go back and feel those feelings. I didn't, and I didn't want to feel the feelings that were even coming up, you know, afresh. I didn't want to feel those feelings of shame. I didn't want to feel any of those feelings. Um, but again, as I started to do this work and like remember, you know, this work of embodiment that um, I did with theater, um, which especially with theater has to do with the embodied language. So to me, it was really what what was so cool about theater is that you can um, speak truth through language in an embodied way that's really useful. And so um, there was this I feel like there's this way to um, look at these feelings that are so uncomfortable um, and to try to meet them as presences and know that even the most uncomfortable feelings are there 
as a guidance system trying to help me, even if I hate them, Mm -hmm. even if I hate shame, it's a guidance system that's trying to help me. Mm-hmm. You know, and I had this this other great realization during this process that I really like to use uh, with other people is I, I had this realization that I was, you know, trying to feel better. I just wanted to feel better. I was like, can I, I just, I don't want to feel this like pain and dissociation. I don't want to feel bad anymore. I don't want to feel bad anymore. I just want to feel better. But I had this realization Mm, well, actually, I'm going to meet these things again. You know, pain is unavoidable. I'm going to meet pain again. I'm going to meet shame again. I'm going to meet fear again. I'm going to meet uncomfortability again. I'm going to meet sadness again. I'm going to meet loss again. And so I realized that my sort of crying outness <laughs> to feel better was actually a crying outness to be better at feeling, Mm. to be better at feeling my feelings when they came up for me. And I think this is that internal authority building process. If I can be better at feeling my feelings when they come up, then I can be faster at responding to them if I can be responsive to my shame when shame shows up and not avoid it, you know, because the more I avoid it, the more it still just exists trying to tell me something. The more it's just mm-hmm. like, uh, you're not paying attention to me, pay attention. Mm-hmm. So the more I can, even if it's uncomfortable, feel my feelings, be better at feeling when my feelings come up, the more responsive I can be and the better, the more useful those emotions are for me because now they're actually acting as a guide and I'm responding to them rather than me trying to deny them or avoid them or think them out of existence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so being feeling better uh, ultimately becomes being better at processing these feelings, listening mm-hmm. to the feelings and feeling the feelings. I love the way you said that. And it makes so much sense because if you can trust yourself to feel better in a different way, not to feel better, but Mm -hmm. to feel better, to be better at feeling, to be a better feeler. Yeah, to be a better feeler, yeah. (laughs) To be a better feeler, then, well, then you're okay because earlier you were saying, and I honestly can't remember if this was before or after we hit record, (laughs) but you're talking about how Change is the name of the game in life, right? Yeah. So you, yep, uh, yep. you know, if you, if you want to be decent at living, you should probably wrap your head around that. The fact that change is a given, right? Yeah. And if yeah. you can trust yourself that you can handle change, that you can handle the unknown, well, then you just improved your entire quality of life for the foreseeable future. Same thing if you can trust yourself to be decent or better at feeling your feelings, well, then you don't have so much to fear, do you? Yeah. You're just like, oh, shame. Here you are again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, all right, what do you want to tell me? You Mm -hmm. know? And some of these things are really appropriate. Or or like I had these ideas about myself too, you know, like – like um, I should be non-judgmental. You know, we we have these these shoulds (laughs) about ourselves. Right. Well – you know, if I'm if I'm if I'm thinking I should be non-judgmental, ultimately that that's a past tense thought. Like if I'm thinking I should be non-judgmental, I already judged something. <laughs> I'm thinking it about myself because it already happened. I already made mm-hmm. the judgment. <laughs> so um too late. It's too late. It, it already it's past tense. I already did it. I have judged something. So um instead I can sort of like you know, say to this inner judge, and this is why, you know, the the theater comes in. I like to like sometimes characterize these things, um, like literally making them into a character. So then like my little judge comes up with his little gavel um, and I'm like, okay, like what, what do you, what do you want to judge? Like, where do you want to slam that gavel down? And what, what, what pronouncements do you want to make? Like what information are you trying to tell me? And then I can, I can listen to that information and I can agree with it or not agree with it. Um, but if I, (laughs) if I deny that it exists, then I'm not going to get, 
I'm not going to get any use value over what just happened. You know, I can disagree with a judgment that I've made, but if I'm like, you should be non-judgmental, <laughs> that that there's there's no use value in that. I think that's a really useful tool, kind of making this caricature of a part of yourself, right? Having your little judge part and yeah. um, the vulnerable parts and the judgy parts. Yeah. And they're all working together. All They're all trying to do something for you, right? The judge is there to what? Enforce law and order to make sure justice is served, to yeah, make sure yeah. that you're being the best person you possibly can. And you're willing to listen to that part, but it, it's not yeah. It's not going to have to, it's not going to run the show. Well, these these things are so overwhelming, you know, mm. and we don't want to dissociate, but they can be so overwhelming that they're hard to grapple with. So what I like to do when, when I'm using arts-based techniques is it deliteralizes the scenario. So mm. instead of dissociating, which would be like, now I have no access to the information, if I if I am able to sort of be more of a witness of, of the emotions, if I can look at them almost like information or characterize them, I can deliteralize it. So now that judge is this little character who, you know, I can give him like, I don't know, maybe I make him bald and I give him a mustache or what, however I characterize him, but I've deliterated literalized it from myself. So now I'm I'm actually um you know whatever that emotion is even if my emotion is judgment I can be less judgmental about myself for having it because I've I've deliteralized it. I haven't made it mm -hmm. um, uh, be so connected to me and my own uh, personalized ideas about myself. I can look at it with with a little mm -hmm. space. It creates a little space to to grapple with these things. When I hear you describe this concept of deliteralizing, which I've never heard before, I love it though. It's it's like the judge is no longer the absolute authority telling the truth. The judge is a part that has something to say that is valid in its own right, but you're you're giving that a different context. Yeah, it's almost more artistic. I mean, I'm I'm seeing kind of the the drama yeah. therapy background again. Like, yeah, okay, let's yeah. give this part a role. Let's give it a character. Let's give it room to express itself. And this is not the authority. This is not the truth. Yeah. This is you know, a part that likes to express itself through claiming authority and claiming a monopoly on yeah. truth. That's part of well, its personality. And it's sometimes hard, so hard for us to listen to what these uncomfortable emotions want, you know? So I, I personally, you know, did this for myself, for example, with my shame, you know, which is one of the most uncomfortable emotions that we can have. Like, it's so, it's, I don't like it. I don't like to work on it either, even though I have worked on it. Um, but I, again, like deliteralized it into a character. And then I let it show me through its embodiment what it wanted. And it was hiding. It mm -hmm. was, and I, so I was like, oh, then I'm starting to connect like shame with this hidingness you know, because shame wanted to hide from me. It wanted to go away. It wanted to curl up. It wanted, you know, and as I'm putting all of these characterizations and physicalizations, and again, these are just spontaneous from my imagination. I could have, I could have had any thought about it. Doesn't, doesn't matter, you know, because it's personal to me. This is, this is how my shame manifests. Um, you know, and you can, I'm sure you can also see, you can see the theater background, but I'm sure you can also see the, the Jungian uh, parts in my background here because he loved active imagination techniques mm -hmm. um, because these are techniques that help us um, use images um, to uh, unravel, you know, mm -hmm. the, these um, emotions that are, that are sometimes so hard to verbalize. But as we image them, um, it can it can give us a lot of information, and that information is not again, it's not it's not literal. You know, it's not like I don't have to tell you an analysis about what I'm feeling. I don't have to like 
conceptualize it for you and tell you about it in a linear fashion. I can just start to explore it as this this image. And there's a really funny Jung story that I, I don't know how much Jung was in your in your um, in your degree practice, but um, I know that we we personally we know some Jungians in our in our um, circles. But uh, there's this really great Jung story where he he did he loved dream work, so he loved to like work with people with their dreams. Um, and he had this client who was like so resistant and he was like, I just, um, like, look, I just want you to go home. I want you to write out this dream. We're going to work up, work on it in your analysis. It's going to tell us, you know, like what's going on in your unconscious processes. Um, you know, we're going to work on it in this way. And the client was like so resistant, but he was like, fine. And he comes back and he brings the dream and he reads it to Jung and Jung is like exploring it. And they're, he, they're making all these, he's making all these connections about the guy's unconscious. And the guy at the end, he was like, like, I did not write down my dream. I made the whole thing up. I made that all up. That wasn't a dream. I made it up. Um, and Jung was like, Mm-hmm. And these are still the things that are coming from your unconscious. Like it doesn't doesn't matter if you made it up because it's what your unconscious came up with. It's still like connected uh, to you. Um, and to me, this this also is part of like getting in touch with your intuition. Is getting in touch with with those those unconscious uh, the unconscious information that 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 is arriving for you. Fun stuff. At least it's fun for people like you and me. I don't know. Maybe people who aren't psychology geeks geeks don't find this stuff fun, but (laughs) I do. (laughs) I hope people will like it. (laughs) I hope you've been enjoying this episode of You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist podcast. If you like what you're hearing, now's a great time to like, subscribe, follow, rate, review, or share. You can also support the podcast by visiting sometherapist.com slash shop where you will find goods and services I've personally curated to support your well-being and enrich your life. We're just building the shop, so check back periodically and feel free to suggest recommendations. All right, now back to the show. So we were going to talk about values. Mm -hmm. And let's just go there. Talk to me about values. So... You know, these are things. Obviously, um, the the values that I value um, are are really very simple, um, and those are the values of embodiment. Uh, and I value those uh, for reasons of boundaries and internal authority building, and those specific values within embodiment that I I want to value into the world (laughs) are intuition and instincts and sense perceptions. Uh, And I think that we live in a culture that really overvalues, um, not just it overvalues our rational linear processes, um, but of course we we are in a culture that is really also valuing um, objectification and dissociation, body dissociation specifically, cognitive dissonance, calling men, women, um, commodification that you can buy things that for your authenticity <laughs> um, and and depersonalization. So uh, to me, I find these uh, to be, problematic. And I also find them to be a real hindrance to safeguarding. Uh, Because if you are living in a cognitive dissonance, uh, it it disassociates you from your own instincts for self protection, um, which, of course, we've we've just spent all this time developing how those are our um, primary guidance system, how they help us grow authority, how they um, put us in touch with ourselves and keep us safe ultimately. Um, and we can't we can't be <laughs> that fully occupied self or that fully occupied house uh, if we are living in cognitive dissonance or living in disembodiment. Um, So I don't know if this is where, you know, we bring up this 
cult of, of gender identities, sort of this notion of disembodied identities um, that we're seeing a lot around us. And we can, we can talk about these topics, of course, without going into that particular ideology, but that particular ideology is really privileging this into the world. And to me, it's, um, it's selling a set of values uh, that are not benign. <laughs> I find these values to be very harmful. Um, they're they're harmful. They're harmful to all of us. Uh, they're harmful to women. They're harmful to men. But most impactfully, they are harmful to kids, um, because when kids are not able to voice their their own sense perceptions of reality, when when they are told they are not allowed to trust their bodies. And what they see and hear uh, with their eyes and their ears, that endangers them. Um, And I think that we are in a place right now where, unfortunately, um, a lot of curriculum that is in the schools is telling kids this. It's telling them um, you can't really trust what your eyes and ears are telling you. You know, you can't really trust what you see. You can't trust your senses. You can't trust your body. You can't trust yourself. And this is very dangerous. Uh, and anyone who follows me online as known heretic knows that I'm always like putting up that little red riding hood meme. It is my favorite meme. I love to use it all the time, but I use it <laughs> because it's such an ancient safeguarding story. You know, that story dates back to the 1600s and it's a, it's a cautionary tale about trusting your eyes and your ears and your nose, (laughs) trusting what you see in front of you and teaching kids to trust themselves and their own perceptions, their own senses before um, trusting, you know, the charming stranger in front of them who is just putting on a presentation that they, they can see through. Um, and kids need to be able to know that they can have internal authority. They can trust themselves, you know, that they can challenge what adults tell them if it goes against their senses. You know, that that's a primary safeguarding tool for kids. It's a it's a it's a primary value set for internal authority building, but it's also a primary value set for safeguarding. And that, that's why I think it's so urgent. I'm, I'm urgently concerned with this. And that's why <laughs> I do this kind of activism work around it as well. Mm-hmm. Well, you really led from your values in approaching this topic, which is how I wanted to approach it today. Because, you know, we started with talking about how we have an inner guidance system. And it's so important for our health and happiness to know our inner guidance system, to hone it and trust it. And to have that inner guidance system connected with embodied values that are grounded in how we approach daily life, right? And so you're talking about encountering an ideology and having some values to ground you so that that house is occupied when the ideology comes in, right? So you're not retroactively inserting these barriers. You're actually in your house living your values of embodiment and the ideology approaches you and your gut instinct tells you there's something off, tells you, wait a minute, there's an ideology that's telling me not to believe my own sense perceptions, not to trust my own instincts, to just believe whatever someone tells me, this sort of mind over matter disembodiment. Well, that that's off for my yeah. values. And when you talk about Little Red Riding Hood, you're talking about it as a cautionary tale that is about trusting your perceptions. And I would add it's also about it, – it's a warning about the limits of agreeableness. Mm, Little Red Riding mm-hmm. Hood is a girl. Mm-hmm. She's she's young and she's female, right? And when we're young, we're vulnerable and impressionable. Mm-hmm. And when we're female, we are um, – by some combination of nature and nurture, we tend to be agreeable, uh, more agreeable than males, right? And and these are things that can bring out some wonderful qualities in people, but they also can make us more susceptible to manipulation and exploitation. So I think that Little Red Riding Hood story, it's about trusting her sense perception and also, frankly, being willing to be rude to quote unquote grandma 
right? And that's something that as females, it's socialized out of us to do. That's, I think, one of the hardest parts for a lot of people. It's not that their instincts aren't telling them anything. It's that they don't want to be nice or they don't want to be rude or upset anyone or come across as anything other than nice. I think, you know, and I think that that I mean, that is especially true for girls. Um, I don't know if you follow um, Let Toys Be Toys on Twitter, uh, but she's an account that will just like go in uh, girls sections and boys section in in stores um, and look at toys and look at clothing. And you'll see how like the little girls clothing will be just like covered and be kind, be kind, be kind, you know, be happy, be kind. I'm a princess. Mm -hmm. And boys clothes are like, you know, dare to be different. Different. Did you, you know, it's like so mm-hmm. active and and um, but also just in general, um, we do have a culture that is pushing kindness. And I was just, I think I don't even remember if I mentioned this to you one day when um I was on a walk and we were talking. Um, but there's all these signs in in the neighborhood that I live in that are like, you know, in this house, we're kind, you know, kindness above everything. And and there's like, I want to say there's like six houses on this block that have these like kindness signs. And I was thinking to myself, you know, kindness is a, the every value is useful for certain scenarios and unuseful for different scenarios. And we cannot be privileging the one value set above another. So to privilege kindness above all other values, um, it puts a lot of other values uh, at the expense. So so privileging kindness puts integrity. It, it, it's they're, they're, They are now juxtaposed because now um, I cannot live in integrity uh, with my own sense perceptions and my own self and my own values uh, and my own boundaries, uh, Mm -hmm. it it means coming up against be kind. Um, And the same one with this value of inclusivity, you know, Mm -hmm. where we are being bombarded with this notion of inclusive, inclusive, inclusive. Now, inclusive is great if I'm hosting a third grade birthday party and I invite the whole class. That is a great time to be inclusive. That's a wonderful time to be inclusive. But it's not a great time to be inclusive when I want to be in a locker room changing only with women and no adult men. That is not a great time to be inclusive. It's not a time Mm -hmm. to be inclusive about whatever the strange man tells you about himself. Mm -hmm. You know, you cannot, I need to be able to have boundaries around my body. Um, That is not a time to be inclusive, you know, and to go back to phenomenology for just a moment Everything in the universe is bounded. That's how matter works. We live in a material universe and it's it's how matter is able to interact with other matter. I'm able to have liquid in this cup because the cup has a boundary. You know, and the way that we interact with each other, we're always interacting in the material universe with boundaries. Everything is bounded um, and boundaries are really important. (laughs) That's how I can have a house (laughs) and bookshelves and books. It's how I can have a lot of things. Um, And it's how, again, it's the primary way that we experience reality. You know, we experience reality through our embodiment and part of that embodiment is being bounded. Um, So, to to privilege inclusivity above all other values and make it a, a prioritized value above other values um, is necessarily uh, going to come at the expense of boundaries, you know? And so a lot of these things are like that, you know? Kindness is going to come at the expense of integrity. Um, so I think it's really important to look at all boundaries um, as having a use value and and also to look at all values as not being necessarily benign. You know, kindness is not necessarily benign. You know, when you are privileging kindness um, above the integrity of your own sense perceptions, that could be said of a lot of things Mm -hmm. that we're seeing right now. You're talking about some very real trade-offs And I 
sometimes wonder if living this culture of relative material abundance and instant gratification, you know, being able to get almost anything at the push of a button, if that has kind of created in us a lack of a sense of those limits that you talk about. And so if we think that we can have anything in an unlimited way and we bring that to how we approach values, then there's this kind of false logic that um, that I can live according to all my values in every situation and they're never in conflict with one another. But that's not true, right? Life, life is full of difficult decisions where it's like, at what point is being quote unquote kind to someone who doesn't seem to be behaving with my best interest in mind? At what point does that sacrifice my own safety or well-being, for instance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was I was looking down for a little while there because you talked about the yard signs. And I don't know if you've seen this. I wanted to find an image that I was thinking of. Oh, uh huh. I'm going to read what the normal yard signs look like. Uh, there are a okay. ton of these in Portland. Okay. So in Portland, there are a ton of signs that say, in this house, we believe Black Lives Matter, women's rights are human rights, no human is illegal, science is real, love is love, kindness is everything. Okay. So have you seen these signs made by uh, an account called Designs Justice? In this house, we believe that simplistic platitudes trite tautologies and semantically overloaded aphorisms are poor <laughs> substitutes for respectful and rational discussions about complex issues. I love that. That's what they everyone an, should have in their yard. They have an Etsy shop, by the way. Let me just give oh, a good. shout out. Yeah, good. Uh, if you want to find this person on Twitter, uh, they are at, at Designs Justice One, and you can find their signs on Etsy. I, I just love that. I also love that. That's, oh my God, that, that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, again, and this goes back to that like thing that we were talking about, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes ago about rule setting. You know, if I'm living my life by rules, then that keeps me from acting spontaneously um, in the moment. And it actually keeps me dissociated, perhaps, from values that I may have. If if I'm living my life by those set of rules that you mentioned with the first signage, then now I, I am not being, I'm not spontaneous um, to, to whatever value I might need in the moment. And ultimately, I want to be able to pull through all these values, you know, like, 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 for example, you know, we, we see this thing a lot of like, no king shaming. Well, public shaming has been a really useful tool for a long time. <laughs> you know, public shaming is useful. You know, the old women of the town used to, if somebody broke a social taboo, they would surround that house and, you know, shame them. Shame, shame, shame. You know, because shame is a useful public deterrent. So all of these things have use value in their moment. Um, same with ultimately, now I, I don't, I like everyone to have free speech. I, I, I do like free speech, but, you know, there is... And I don't like when it's misused. I, I don't know. We're, we're, I'm going to grapple with this, and ooh, maybe it'll be spicy. But um, but cancel culture per se. You know, there there's um there's a reason why it's so effective. Now, I don't necessarily like how it's used, but this goes back to the old notion of banishment. You know, there's a reason in the play Oedipus. Oedipus is a character who breaks every social taboo. He sleeps with his mother and has kids with her and kills his father. You know, he bre he breaks every familial taboo and every social taboo. Um, and at the end of the play, he has judgment passed upon him and he's not put to death. He is banished, you know, because banishment <laughs> at that time was the ultimate social prohibitive. And it is still a social prohibitive. Um, of course, you know, there, there is also a problem with mom mentality. But that, that I, my point is just that 
There is use value in all of these things. And you can't say that these things are across the board bad or across the board good because they have a use value for certain scenarios. And we have to have the internal authority to have adaptability to spontaneously respond to these things as they arrive. You know, so I don't want to say no to any of these values in my tool chest. I want to be able to to use all the emotions in my tool chest and all the values in my tool chest. I want to be like, aha, this is the appropriate time for shame. This is the appropriate time for banishment. This is the appropriate time for kindness. This is the appropriate time for boundaries. And, and I want to have you know, my own authority and trust to have access to all of these things so I can use them at the appropriate times uh, for myself. And I would add, when you talk about the idea of kink shaming or any time that there's sort of a, a anti-shame or a shame about shaming, uh, I have concerns there about the externalizing and projecting of normal human shame because we all have shame. Uh, it, it is a part of our makeup. And uh, there's, there's a reason that anyone with some degree of kinkiness in their sexual makeup, um, or even, you know, the most vanilla person, you know, there's a reason we have shame about sex is that it, it serves valuable personal and social functions for certain things mm -hmm. to remain behind closed doors or shared in confidences with those you've built appropriate degrees of intimacy with, right? So, um, you know, I'm I'm pretty liberal when it comes to what people want to do behind closed doors with other consenting adults. I don't cast much judgment about that. I think, you know, there's a role of curiosity if someone wants to talk to me as a client about what role any particular kink might play in their sexuality. But what about the part of the individual with the kink that goes, I should really keep this to myself, you know, because that's that's what a reasonable person does. A reasonable person doesn't want to bring very much of their sexuality out into the world. Sexuality is a really private, personal thing. Most people share it with, you know, one consenting adult at a time. There's, you know, a small number of individuals who uh, share their sexuality with more than one person at a time. But by and large, it is, um, you know, right up there with... Uh, you know, what you do in the bathroom. It's like nobody's yeah. business. You know, <laughs> everyone respects a closed door, you know, part of civil society is you respect a closed door. And, uh, and, and that's to our benefit, you know, and you, you yeah. have to wonder about what kind of person doesn't want that door to be closed because I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think most healthy individuals would, uh, not be able to feel comfortable in the bathroom or enjoy what they're doing in the bedroom if the door were open, so to speak. And yeah, so I know I think, people who I know people who literally can't be intimate if their dog is in the room. Like they don't want their dog to watch. Well, <laughs> Not yeah. That the dog cares. But like, you know, that's how that's a <laughs> there's a natural privacy tendency, as I guess. Yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And it's it is really bizarre to me that there are so many people who for whatever reasons uh, want their sexuality to be public, um, no. you know, whether that's that they're posting or their pornography on Pornhub or they're taking racy pictures of themselves or they're just talking about their sexuality to whatever degree in places where that's like not what people are there to talk about. I mean... <laughs> Well, I think that, you know, one, I mean, there's absolutely an exhibitionist fetish. So, you know, people who are exhibitionists get off on basically creating a, a not cre creating, a, making other people sort of unwilling participants in their sexuality and they get off on that. Um, and I think one of the things that we didn't talk about, um, which I, I think this is maybe the appropriate time to bring this up, is that 
we have uh, such a culture of external validation, you know, and I think that is one of the biggest illnesses that we see in culture across the board, whether it's, you know, whether it has to do with uh, gender ideology and like, quote unquote, validating someone's identity, whether it has to do with like what you said, these hypersexualized pictures that people put up uh, about themselves for likes and they, they sort of do this whole self-objectification thing for likes. But there is, you know, kind of across all culture, and this is this is part, ultimately, it's part of capitalist consumerism. It's part of how our advertising system functions and how social media functions, how both of those entities function, which are such big entities in our life, is that we need a constant stream of external validation. And if you have no internal authority, you really need that external validation. Mm -hmm. If you are not in touch with your Mm -hmm. own internal authority, one, culture is telling you, you need external validation. You need likes. You need followers. You need these accolations. You need someone to agree with you about your, you know, identity persona. You need external validation. Um, And someone who who doesn't have that um, equilibrium within themselves, who doesn't have that internal authority, um, who doesn't have good boundary setting, you know, you're going to feel a draw for that. And ultimately it's an, it's an unquenchable thirst. It's a, it's an unsatiable hunger. It's something that you will constantly have to strive after because it's ultimately a need that you are trying to externally fill. And the only way you can fill it is, you know, from yourself. You can't, no one else can really fill it because you are ultimately telling everyone else and yourself I don't value me. I need Mm -hmm. other people to Mm -hmm. value me. That's you know, it's so shallow and hollow and fragile, and it makes me sad just to think about it. I mean, my mind's going over here in the background, just just thinking, and you know, sometimes I'll relate to my own experiences to try to understand something better. And I'm thinking about my own personal relationship and how, you know, someday he and I will do a podcast episode about how we met and, we'll, you know, share our little insights it. about what makes for healthy you relationships. Should. And <laughs> we'll, we'll do some other stuff too. You know, we both have public presences in various ways and podcasts and stuff like that. But, you know, all the little things that make up a relationship, when I think about the complexity of my relationship with this other human being, there's very little of that that I could even convey to the outside world if I wanted to, you know, because yeah. the the longer you spend with somebody and the more rich and complex your interactions, the more you kind of develop a language between the two of you. And, you know, we're far in enough that we have words and phrases and looks and gestures that mean things to us that would mean nothing to anybody else. And that is part of the delight of having a lo- loving long-term relationship. Um, You know, we just have so many little inside jokes, right? And if I think about what part of me might want to show that to anybody, put it on display, I mean, it instinctively it feels intrusive. It feels like mm-hmm. it would take something away mm-hmm. um, that, that I really value, like it would cheapen mm-hmm. those things, you know? Like even the other night, I... Um, we did something special. We went out for a really nice dinner to celebrate the launch of my podcast because yes. I have no idea when this episode will be airing, but the date we're recording this episode is the day right after I launched the podcast. Yeah. So, you know, last night we went out to a special dinner and I don't usually do this sort of thing. I'm not big on like t- taking selfies to post on Instagram, but I was like, you know, let's take a selfie and post on Instagram a little story that we're going out to celebrate dinner. And I did that. And you know, I, I got like a tiny bit of gratification out of that, but just as much it took away from the moment that I was sharing with my loved one to do that. And I can't imagine uh, my life being half as happy without a supportive relationship like this. So yeah. when I when I try to imagine what could life be like for someone who wants to take something so personal and intimate as what they share in bed with another human being and put that on display for the world and expect the world not only to, only to validate, but but even to understand it. It's like, you know, I, I wouldn't expect anyone to understand what the word seaweed means 
when I say it to my sweetheart <laughs> because it's our it's our inside joke, you know? Yeah. And like it makes me really sad. It's like and and, and that I would say is a recurring theme when I think about the gender crisis is I I just, at the end of the day, I feel sad for how impaired people's relationships are because of that combination of looking for the external validation rather than building a, you know, a robust, cohesive, genuine sense of identity, self-trust, self-esteem, belonging, true relationships. You know, it's the fragility of all that, the fragility of a false constructed sense of self I mean, I'm not even going to get into reliance on the medical system. That's for another time, right? But but to make your own body suffer. Yeah. And it, in the hopes that you'll fit in with other people, right? And yeah. then and then thinking about kind of the long-term impacts and this is really really sad, hard stuff to look at, but I but I, I think we need to look at it because we're going to see the long-term impacts of this over the next few decades. The kids who are taking puberty blockers now um, are not going to experience sexual functioning. They're not going to experience no. orgasm. They're going to be no. sterile, but no. you know, they're, they're not ever going to know the, the joys of relationships. I mean, hopefully I, I don't want to, I don't want to doom and gloom. I really truly hope that anyone who's doing any of this gender affirming care medicine stuff now in the in the 2020s when you know we know this is time limited because the malpractice suits are coming and the fallout is coming but anyone who's doing this stuff now i really wish the best for them like i i really hope to see the harms minimized and i hope that they do have healthy relationships and i'm encouraged that there are several detransitioners i follow on social media who do have these happy relationships now and I'm, I'm happy for them. But I worry about people who are not going to be able to experience sexual pleasure and who are modifying their bodies, modifying their bodies in a way that, you know, might kind of appeal to people who have fetishes and aren't necessarily the best choice of partners or isn't necessarily the most kind of broad range of partners to choose from. And then what kind of sex is possible between people when one person can't actually experience any pleasure from that sex? Yeah. Um, and it, the, I just, I really worry about people's future relationships and it makes I me so sad well. because that's like the number one thing for, for mental and physical health. Like the, <laughs> it, the, the most bang for your buck, if you're to invest your time and energy and self-development into, into one goal, and you want it to pay off the most for your happiness, it is to do whatever you need to do to get yourself into a healthy, happy relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I really right. feel for people who who struggle with that. I think you're right. And I think, you know, I love that you use the word um, intimacy because I I do think that is, um, I do think that's partner to partner intimacy, but I also think it is it starts with intimacy with oneself, you know, again, going back to knowing myself. I remember I had this uh, realization a few years back where I I had to really look at myself and look at um, like h- kind of how I wanted to be and how I was. Now, um, I, I want to be, I want to be seen, uh, as a kind person, as a caring person, as a compassionate person. I think I had this conversation with you before, actually, now that I'm saying it and a loving person, a generous person, a flexible person, a non-judgmental person. Um, and I realized that I could not I, that I was ultimately what I was doing in my life at that point as I was performing those things for other people. So I could perform them to, for other people, but I wasn't really being those things because I could not be those things to myself. Um, and I think that the same is true with intimacy. You know, I cannot really um, offer intimacy to someone else unless I can be intimate with myself. And that that really involves this, this thing of knowing myself, you know, loving myself, being, being able to be entertained by myself. You know, I do happen to live alone right now. And I would say, I'm very entertained by myself. I crack myself up. I um, am entertained by myself. I 
you know, provide myself with a lot of experiences. I like doing activities with myself. You know, I like writing with myself or doing art projects with myself or, you know, being in my garden with myself. I like being with myself. You know, I also, of course, like to be with others. Um, but I'm I'm able to find a lot of pleasure in being intimate uh, with myself, and so that is a quality that I have to offer someone else. I have I have true intimacy to offer because I'm able to give that to myself, and I think that you know, unfortunately, that you know, I I, I worry that these um, the people who are falling into this are. Um, they're they are having a missed opportunity for for connection with other because they are um, practicing a, a disconnect from themselves. They are not having personal intimacy with themselves. And and I I also worry about. I mean, I think it is just absolute abuse to. Um, set someone up to never have sexual pleasure. You know, you can still have relational intimacy, but but to never have that sexual intimacy with someone, that, that is an absolute abuse. And to take it from kids who have never had it before, they don't even know what they're missing out on. Um, and, and as you said, it sets them up to be a fetishized person for other people who are going to put a lot of predation on them. And if they already have no boundaries around their body, they are even more vulnerable to that kind of predation. And you brought up detransitioners. And I had a really interesting interaction, I don't know, a week or so ago uh, on Twitter with a detransitioner who was having this moment of questioning. You know, um, this person was like, I I was I felt like I was in this cult which was was trans and and I was doing all these things with this cult that didn't necessarily pertain to me but now I feel like there's there's all of this like sort of doctrinality to gender criticalness and and I don't know if this is a cult mm. and they were having this real conflict and I felt for them and and I basically gave them <laughs> that that empty house metaphor that I that I just gave everyone here which is you the the way that you the only way to grapple with the dilemma that you are currently having is to fully embody yourself. You have to be your own authority with yourself. And if you have authority with yourself, then you can have discernment. You can discern, oh, this feels right to me and this doesn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. But if I'm dissociated from my feelings, then I can't tell what feels mm -hmm. right and what yeah. feels wrong because I'm just going on other people as an external authority and what they're telling me. Um, and I do right. think that that part of <laughs> this whole internal authority building process is a kind of an intimacy. You know, it is being intimate in that way with yourself, having, you know, just like what you were describing with your partner, like, moments and in jokes and special occasions you know i think it's really hard uh, be because the culture is the way it is to conceptualize how we can make ourselves into our own special person you know how can i treat myself as a special person you know of course i would want my my partner to to see me as special but um you know, but I don't have to wait for that. You know, I don't have to wait for an external person to to value me. Um, you know, I can first find that for myself and be that with myself. Um, yeah, I, I think intimacy is a great way to describe it. One more thing I want to talk with you about, Amy, is, um, well, as you had put it, solutions. And mm. I want to connect that with personal power because as I was telling you before we started recording, one of the reasons I feel like I vibe with you, like, that's my girl, that's Amy, yeah. we're, you know, on the same wavelength is um, I think we're both these kind of strong, powerful women and and we have a similar kind of approach to embodiment and values. And when I've heard you talk about, you know, feeling the need to present yourself in the past as uh, kind and generous and all these kind of things, I remember the first time I heard you tell me that I thought, 
gosh, I see you that way, but that's like the least interesting thing about you to me, you know? <laughs> like like women are generally nice. Like yeah, you're yeah, nice yeah. along with like 80% yeah. of other females, you know? But like <laughs> what's really interesting about you is how strong you are and how creative, right? And if your sense of self is weak enough, anything can be a cult. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and and I, I love what you said to that person because ultimately you need to be able to navigate all kinds of different people. And one thing I love about what you could call the gender critical movement is that it, it's a lot of different kinds of people. I mean, we yeah. come from all walks of life, all political and religious backgrounds. Um, you know, many of us were like highly, highly progressive before certain things kind of woke us up to some of the concerns about progressive ideology. Uh, you know, we come from a lot of backgrounds. We're a very intellectually diverse group. And one of the reasons that we're here is because we are willing to be into intellectually diverse. And I think that's great. And within that, you'll find a lot of different segments in the gender critical community. And some of them are very attached to their way of doing things. You have the radical feminists and you have the this and you have the that. But I think the whole point is diversity is great. Within diversity, it's okay to have differences. It's okay to have people you like, people you don't like. I like you, Amy. I like. There's a lot of people in this world I like. There's also I block people on Twitter who follow me because they love what I have to say on gender, but I just don't like how they interact with people. Like I'm like, you're you're using the same kind of logical fallacies and manipulation tactics in your arguments with people on the internet that that you probably don't like when they're used against you. And I just, you know, I'm not into that. And so I've, uh, you know, I think it's okay. I think it's a sign of health in a community to have, you know, a broad and diverse enough community that you you have some people you click with more than others. And there are people who are doing very similar work to what I've done where I've expressed enough, you know, some disagreement with them. Um, and, and I think that's a good thing because, you know, out of the people who follow my work because they're interested in what I have to say on gender, um, I see a lot of cynicism and despair. And some of that's very understandable, especially, you know, people who have been the most harmed or people who are like really dealing with, uh, some of the most negative outcomes. Yeah. Um, and, and we're going to see more of those outcomes and th there will be more, I think, trauma on a scale that we've not even seen before. But, I think my own stance, my preferred approach is that there is no room for cynicism because I exist. I'm here. I'm still living my life. And it's like I was saying to you before I started the call, right? Like, Amy, you are not God, but you are this infinitesimal little part of God. And the part of the universe that is yours, like, you're going to make that part awesome according to your own standards. And that's what I'm going to do, too. And so sometimes when I hear people falling prey to you know, nothing's ever going to change because this, that, and the other. Um, it's like, well, I think you're overlooking something. I think you're overlooking your own personal agency. And as part of that, you have the ability to kind of correct your perceptual lens there because you can look at the glass half empty and you can see evidence for all those, you know, ails in the world and, and you'd be right, right? But mm -hmm. But what about everything else that you're not looking at? Um, so we do have personal agency in what we choose to look at and how we choose to interpret it and how we make sense of it and then how we want to go about living our lives. And I feel like as long as I'm here, I'm good because I am that embodied house. I do have my own values. And part of the fun of life is that I get to bring myself and my values to whatever life's going to throw at me. And, you know, when, when the more you practice courage and just living authentically and truthfully and taking risks and taking leaps of faith, it, it gets to be fun. The things that used to be scary. I'm not saying I don't have fear. I still have tons of fear about a lot of things. But but also there's kind of like this, um, oh, you want to go? Okay. All right. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. And like, this is my opportunity to show up. This is the tiny little corner of the universe that the powers that be put me in to decorate the way I see, please. <laughs> and, and, you know, here's how I'm going to decorate it. Here's the music I'm going to play. Here's the incense I'm going to burn. And, you know, here's the way I'm going to greet the eyes of the next stranger I see. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, I, I, um, so a couple of things in what you said. Um, one, I'm just going to start where you left off. It's a practice, you know, mm-hmm. like just like a yoga practice is a practice. Um, this is something that you, uh, one, develop Mm -hmm. (laughs) and can get better at, um, but that you also never stop practicing, you know, that you continue to practice it. And it's a skill building process, you know, so all of these things, embodiment, intuition building, instinct uh, recognition, um, courage, you know, these are all practices that we can do skill building around, you know, and, and it's not, they're not so, they're not really as nebulous as they sound, you know, courage is like that, that sounds so like, it sounds like something that you either have or you don't, but that's not the truth. It's, it's something that you can practice and develop over time. And all of these things are that, you know, another thing that, that came up for me when you were talking about cynicism, uh, as I was, I was thinking about, um, uh, the the sort of religious phrase of seek and ye shall find and and you know um, I grew up in a Christian household and and this comes up a, a lot in in Christianity but uh, and you know it's uh, one of those things that I have really found true and the funny thing is um, is that for for me is that I um, connect it to phenomenology as well. I connect it to our embodiment because phenomenology says that we are always particularly situated. So we are always embodied. And in that embodiment, we are always particularly situated. And that situation is like my literal place, like this chair in this room and this house and this uh, town in this state in this country. Um, so that's particular to my situation. But particular to my situation is also, um, you know, my experiences, my my family history, my cultural background. Um, all of these are particular to to my situation and also my attitude. And and all of these things that are particular to my situation ultimately create a lens. Um, just like people use that, that phrase of seeing the world through rose colored glasses, you know, you could see the world through cynicism colored glasses and, and that lens is going to influence how you interact with the world. And, and to me, you know, even though I, I sort of have like shifted my direction from, from the religion that I grew up with, um, that, that that little idea is is i feel it's very literal you know this idea of seek and ye shall find because if you are if you have an expectation of what you are going to find in the world you know you're going to look out at, at the vast horizon in front of you you're going to scan the field you're going to see a lot of things but if you are expecting to find one thing, that is the thing you're going to find. You know, just like if I'm, you know, if I'm expecting to see trees and I'm scanning a vast horizon, there's probably going to be one tree at least in that horizon. And and if that's what I'm expecting to see, I'm going to single that out as as the thing in my vision that that I I have particularized on. And that's what that lens does for us. I think cynicism, I mean that that's actually that's a really, I mean, even though I've just spent a lot of time saying like, you know, oh, there's space for all values, you know, I don't know. I, you know, maybe we would have to go into that more. Like what, what is the particular occasion for cynicism? And maybe, maybe I like skepticism a little bit more. Cause I think there's like a healthy skepticism that should be had about things. But again, it's not, even if, even if there's a particular occasion for cynicism, it's not, the value that I want to use at all occasions. You know, I ultimately want to be, you know, the, the neutral sort of channel. So I can, as I said, like draw from these different values at different times. So, so to constantly, um, be, uh, cynical is going to, you know, influence how I'm going to spontaneously interact with the world. 
And we can put on lenses for occasions because, you know, ultimately I do like, I also like to put on a very hopeful lens. <laughs> you know, I want to look at the world with a hopeful lens, even though I get very angry, I get very frustrated. Um, I have a lot of things to critique I lo- and I love to critique things because <laughs> it uses all of my skill sets. But, you know, I want to ultimately... Um, be hopeful that things will change. And also, as I did, I think in the story, I did, I do think I told that story beforehand, Um, but things are always going to change. So we can expect that change will happen. I know you're a more avid reader than myself. Have you read Woke Racism by John McWhorter? Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. Woke Racism. No. Yeah. Okay. It came out, I feel like it came out pretty recently. I listened on Audible because I'm more of an audiobooks person. Um, and I also really like John McWhorter's voice. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, does he read it himself? I love yeah. when authors read it themselves. Yeah. I, yeah. He's just so incisive, but I, there's something about his approach in that book that I really liked, which is he names a specific type of person or people. He calls them the elect, right? The people who are kind of trying to control the discourse. Yeah. Um, and his approach in the book is these people aren't going away anytime soon. And you know what? This book isn't for them. I'm not trying to change their minds. This book is for everyone else, the silent majority, who don't appreciate this vocal, aggressive minority trying to dictate how the rest of us live our lives. Yeah. Uh, so this is for everyone else. Uh, how, how are we going to deal with these people? Like, how, yeah. how are we going to live our lives and run our businesses and our institutions that allow society to function and conduct our affairs and our relationships in spite of and moving around these people who are trying to control everything. And I just love that because I think that that is, that is in some ways the antidote to cynicism, right? Because cynicism yeah. and powerlessness says, oh my God, there's this really aggressive vocal minority of extremists who's trying to control everything and now I have to spend the rest of my life complaining about them and fighting with them, that's kind of powerless. And yeah, that's a recipe for poor mental health if, if that's your worldview. Yeah. Um, but there's, okay, who else is in the room? Who's being spoken over? Who's afraid to speak? I'm, n- I'm not alone. I'm a reasonable person. The world is filled with other reasonable, you know, fair-minded people. And, uh, you know, how do we I don't want to say drown out the bullies, but just like mute them a little bit, kind of like, or there's a visualization actually that I've used to help clients before where um, like I'm thinking about uh, someone I was working with who had a really, really horrible ex, just super paranoid and controlling and accusatory and abusive. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we we started off talking about how he he was this very loud voice in her head that was like right here in her face all the time. That was how she'd internalized him from her years of abuse, Right. And so we talked about just kind of like, and for those who are listening, I'm I'm using my hand to kind of visualize pulling something from being right over my face to like a few inches of distance and breathing room and kind of shrinking. And we worked uh, with this one thing person I'm thinking of, we worked on kind of like visualizing putting him in a bubble and allowing mm. that bubble to become smaller and further away. And so that it eventually kind of felt like when she visualized him, he was this tiny little man in this bubble in which he could scream all he wanted, scream and gesticulate in his little (laughs) bubble. But ultimately, it was just muffled sounds coming out. I like that. So I I think that's kind of an analogy for John McWhorter's approach to the elect. Mm. Put put them Mm. in that bubble. Yeah. And give yourself at least a few inches of breathing room from them. Because you still want to live your life. And there are a lot of other people who are trying to live their lives too. Yeah. You know, for me, I like to think about Tai Chiing this thing, you know, because, you know, I, I do, um, you know, I do take pleasure in like, I guess, arguing. I do take pleasure in direct arguing. Um, I wish I maybe didn't take quite so much pleasure in it, but I I love making analysis as I love creating arguments. Um, So I I do take some pleasure in it. But I also, uh, because I like believe what I believe about embodiment, um, 
I don't think there's necessarily necessarily a lot to be gained um, from one-on-one arguments. I think the one-on-one arguments that I have online, I I try to actually think of those as uh, presentational for an audience who is behind me, um, because I'm not really expecting to change the mind of the person that I'm I'm arguing with. I, I think of it as an illustration of how to create a critique. So when I'm actually actually thinking about solutions because I don't think arguing head to head is a solution. You know, if I if I look at the problem head on and I come at the problem head on, I think that's just a butting of heads, you know, that it's it's not really changing anything. It's a conflict that's not really shifting anything. But when I think about solutions and actually shifting something, I think of like more Tai chi it. So I, I think of it more of like receiving that energy and taking that energy in and shifting. And I think that it has to shift um, at the level of the values. You know, it's not going to shift You know, even though I can say, like, I don't think kids are born in the wrong body. I don't think they should be sterilized. I don't think they should be, have their genitals mutilated. I don't think girls should have their breasts bound. I don't think they should get double mastectomies. I don't think kids should be cognitively impaired or have, suffer bone damage or lose sexual function and pleasure. None of this. Um, I, those are true things that I believe, but I think that ultimately we we kind of the solution i think is to get above the argument on the level of the values um and that's why i think if we had like if we had kids that were that were we were building their internal authority that they could validate themselves that were fully embodied that were fully occupied that trusted their instincts and their intuitions and their sense perceptions if we um, could sh- we could shift this? Um, it would ha- it would happen. The solution is on um, that values level, and it's not really going to happen at the head on um, level. And I think that that's how we've seen things shift in the past. You know, um, when we've had things like you know, and sometimes you know, our our, our psychiatric community of the past has has prescribed things that were harmful, like lobotomies. You know, but we didn't. We didn't shift them um, only. I mean, these were influ- influencing factors were saying how bad these things were, but we didn't shift it only on those terms. We shifted it on a, a values level um, way. And I think that's the best way that that we're going to create solutions for anything that we want to see. And I think, you know, not just with gender ideology, but anyone who wants to create a solution for yourself, like, again, like, we can't make a plotting plan to like deal with culture. We can't make a like X, Y, Z, and this is going to happen. And, you know, this is funny because this is an argument that I had with my friends, Uh, a friend of mine way back. um, I don't even remember. I don't remember what, I don't remember what we had the argument about, but it's not important. But she was saying, um, you know, that the only way that we ever got thing changed was through legislation. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, Ultimately, legislation is the slowest way. It's the last step of of social change. It's always the last step. The first step is always values and changing the cultural values. And there has to be a a mass of people who, who value the new values. And then the very last step is getting legislation to enact it. You know, but you have to have this critical mass of people who want those values shifted, you know, and, and, and culture would never have changed at all. The the legislation would never have changed without the value shift. You know, we, we never would have uh, desegregated schools without the value shift happening first. We never would have had um, gay marriage without the value shift happening first. So a value shift always comes before for uh, the change in legislation. And I think, you know, the same is true for anything that you want to value into the world. That reminds me of a story. Have you read The Better Angels of Our Nature by Steven Pinker? Oh, no. Yes. No, I know. I haven't read that one. I know Steven Pinker's work, but I haven't read that one. I couldn't get through it because they're 
there's a <laughs> lot of violence. But uh, but there is a part I did read. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, Steven Pinker takes a different view on history and frames our current era as a time that we've actually really made a lot of progress when it comes to violence and injustice, that we've become more humane. And really, it's it's a case for optimism. I think that's kind of the overall theme of this very thick book. Um, so he goes into the history of violence and um, he shares among many, many other things about a time when dueling was very common practice, uh, I think in like the 1800s in the US and Britain. I don't know. I'm not good at history, but um, and I don't remember this very specifically, but but men resolved their issues through dueling. And, you know, it could be the slightest, uh, well, the slightest slight to one's dignity. It could have, you know, you looked at my wife the wrong way and now I need to show you who's boss, right? <laughs> and so men would challenge each other to a duel and, and you know, often one would die. And uh, so how did this practice become outdated? Well, it wasn't, it didn't start with the legislature, like you're saying. What it started with was that the younger generation of men started to think this wasn't cool. Yeah. They started laughing it off and mocking it as like a thing that backwards old men did. And it just became uncool. And that was how they did away with the practice of dueling. So it starts with, like you're saying, values and, and culture. And that's where we as participants in society have the power to make a difference because you know, we each have the option to get in touch with what our own values are and what kind of culture we want to co-create and then go look for our people, right? And yeah, um, I know a lot of people are afraid of taking risks. And I get that because there are truly people who could lose their jobs um, or, you know, their sense of safety if they were to put themselves out there with what they really think. So I want to be sympathetic to, you know, the individual circumstances people are navigating. But I think for a lot of people who really could potentially afford to take the risk that it's it's worth it to take the risk and and you know risk losing friends in some cases even risk losing employment or reputation um because this whole other world opens for you of getting to live truthfully and to find your people and then you're no longer gaining approval based on presenting a false image of yourself you're gaining genuine friendship and camaraderie and intellectual community through being authentic and exploring and finding your fellow people. So to those who are thinking of, you know, taking chances of, you know, becoming outspoken <laughs> in the ways that Amy and I are, um, there's a lot of good that awaits you on the other side of that leap of faith. Yeah, I think so too. And I think that it's so ugh, refreshing, you know, like when I sort of took that plunge, <laughs> um, you know, and and became really public with all of my thoughts and beliefs around this. You know, I I did lose a lot of friends. I lost a large portion of my community. It, it was rough. Like, I mean, I'm not going to pretend it wasn't rough. However, um, as you said, it was also liberating um, because then I was no longer constraining myself. You know, and I no longer felt those constraints. You know, suddenly having shed all of that, you know, then I was ultimately free. I was very free. You know, I no longer had to, you know, tiptoe around being careful of what I was saying and who I was with and who knew what I really thought and who didn't know what I thought. And, you know, it taught me some of these larger lessons that I'm incorporating today. And it's hilarious because I thought, <laughs> I thought I knew, I thought I already knew a lot <laughs> about, all of these things, you know, I thought I already knew a lot about embodiment. I thought I thought I already knew a lot about um, developing personal authority. I thought I already knew a lot about all of these things, um, but ultimately, um, that uh, sort of starting to speak publicly about this issue. Um, it just, it was like, I don't know, I guess it was like that, the doctorate level course in those things. Like it taught me experientially parts that I hadn't yet realized for myself. I hadn't, I had maybe conceptualized them, but I hadn't 
embodied them. You know, I hadn't really felt them. Um, and confronting that, you know, confronting real, actual public scorn. You know, I live in a fairly small town and ultimately I had used to be a very public and beloved figure in my small town. Um, and then I was very much a social pariah in this town. But again, like the, the gifts that the gifts of freedom and, and just, um, living my values that came from it were really refreshing. And it's like, now, um, I go forward with so much more of that. And I think that, um, you know, I think, and I don't know, maybe this is where healthy skepticism comes in because I, I do, I do actually think you and I have spoken about healthy skepticism, um, with dealing with the people that we meet now, because, you know, I do have this tendency, someone I was watching, I was watching someone today who was like, tribalism is real, you know, and I think that that tribalism can be real. Like you meet someone who seemingly has your own values and you want to be like, we have a connection because we connect on this one aspect of my values. Um, But I think more and more I'm able to have a, a healthy skepticism. Like, yeah, we agree on this one thing, but like, let's see, like, let's see if we you know, have enough common values to develop a relationship over because, you know, just because we share common values on this one issue doesn't mean that you are a person that I want to have intimacy with in my life. You know, I think there, there's, uh, I think I've, I've, I've learned some lessons about that in, um, in this gender critical realm, <laughs> um, which are fine. You know, these are fine lessons to learn. I'm, I'm sure it's not the last time I will meet them, but hopefully every time I meet them, um, I'll be better and I'm better at meeting them and faster at responding. Well, Amy, it's always so much fun talking to you. I feel like I could talk to you forever, but it's been almost two hours that we've been going. <laughs> so we should probably wrap it up now. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and tell people where they can find you? Uh, yay. Um, everyone, you know, my most known platform is Twitter at known heretic. Um, I also have my YouTube channel at known heretic. Uh, my new project is little red reverberations. I will have, or I do have a website, little red reverberations. It's, it's under construction, but you can, you can visit it now. Uh, it is still in development. Um, but that is the new project. That is the, uh, signage under which I will be doing uh, workshops and retreats out of my own space. Uh, and I have been operating under that name um, at the retreats that I'm doing uh, with my friend Ashley uh, Dial of Antler and Ash. Uh, so Little Red Reverberations, you can um, you can see me, you'll expect to see me uh, branding in that direction as well. But for now, uh, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Instagram and Facebook are all known heretic spaces. And um, you can see some of my own work on YouTube, um, exploring some of these topics that I've been speaking about here today. Fun. All right. Well, it's been such a pleasure. And maybe I'll have you back sometime. I would love that. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. I hope you enjoyed this episode of You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist podcast with Stephanie Wynn, LMFT. This podcast is produced by Eric and Amber Beals at Different Mix. Special thanks to the talented musician Joey Pecorero for our theme song, Half Awake. At SomeTherapist.com, you can find more information on any topic, guest, resource, product, or service you've heard of here today. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram at SomeTherapist. If you would like to ask a question, suggest a topic, be a guest, or invite me to speak, you can email us at hello at sometherapist.com. You can also send us a voice memo with your question, and we just might play it. Of course, just because I'm some therapist doesn't mean I'm your therapist. This podcast is not a substitute for medical advice. If you need help, ask your doctor or browse your local therapists online. And whatever you do next, please take care of yourself. Eat well, sleep well, move your body, get outside, and tell someone you love them. You're worth it.